Good afternoon, everybody. Just give everybody a minute to take their seats. Well, what a wonderful meeting. It's so lovely to have in-person meetings again. Some people have been really, really missing that. So a warm welcome to you all. I'm Himla Sudial, the Executive Officer at the Academy of Science for South Africa. And it is indeed a great pleasure for us to uh, join forces with STIAS and the uh, two phases of the future professorial program, uh, the phase one from Stellenbosch and the second one at University of Johannesburg. And I wish to welcome all the management of those uh, particular institutions, uh, in particular Professor Edward uh, Kirumura, who is going to uh, address us in a minute. Thank you so much for hosting us at STEERS. Uh, my own principal and um, uh, president of the academy, Professor Jonathan Janssen, distinguished guests from all the universities who are present here today, of course our fellows from the Future Professorial Program, ladies and gentlemen. I could go on with such an esteemed list of uh, people in the audience today, as well as the many who are joining us online. So welcome to you all. It is really, really a privilege for me to, uh, to pay tribute to our guest today, Professor Gurnau, and his wife, Dr. Denise Gurnau. Welcome. Thank you so much for traveling the long journey to be here today and to uh, deliver our annual humanities lecture, but I'm not going to tell you everything just yet. But before we continue, I'd like to in, in, invite Professor Kirumira to give us a little welcome from STIAS. Thank you very much, Himla, and I think you've done um, a service to all of us. We don't have to go through the protocol. Uh, just to say, all protocol observed. <laughs> um, so, most welcome to uh, STEERS, most welcome to this combined effort uh, with the South African Academy of Sciences. Uh, we are pleased that we are welcoming back our fellow. Um, Abdul Razak was a fellow of, the, of STEERS in 2018. And so I think in a way we share the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so thank you all for taking time off. Thank you particularly to um, our STIAS fellow for accepting uh, the um, invitation that was um, extended to him. And Denise, thank you for doing the pushing um, on the other side. So all of you are welcome, Steers. Uh, some of you, it's your first time to come here, and I would like you to uh, take time also to look around and see um, Steers is um, still the only uh, institute for advanced study in the southern hemisphere, not just in Africa. So we're trying very much to make sure that these spaces are replicated. Um, uh, in, in various ways. So welcome to the uh, creative space for the mind, as our motto goes, and I'm sure that our uh, speaker is going to lead us in this creative space of the mind by the presentation that is going to be, uh, to be made. So welcome again, and feel at ease, and again, all protocol observed. The good thing with STIAS is once you enter the, the, the doors of STIAS, you lose the titles. <laughs> So that allows you then to reflect, communicate, engage um, effectively, I think. So thank you very much, and all the best this evening. A humble man and a very distinguished one at that, so thank you very much. Now it's my pleasure to invite Professor Jonathan Janssen to give us a welcome on behalf of the Academy and uh, to take the program forward. Jonathan. You'll have to adjust the height. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what a wonderful day for African literature. Welcome to the annual Humanities Lecture of the Academy of Science of 
South Africa, and a special word of welcome to Dr. Denise de Carriers Narain, a distinguished scholar of literature known for several editions of contemporary Caribbean women's poetry, and the subtitle Making Style, which has been described as the first sustained account of Caribbean women's poetry. Denise uh, was a reader in English at the University of Sussex and is accompanied by our speaker. <laughs> the <laughs> you are relieved of giving the lecture. The Ass of Humanities lecture is intended to draw national attention to urgent questions in the humanities and social sciences as reflected in the previous six lectures. Professor Kwasi, Kwesi Pra spoke here on decolonizing the humanities. Professor Njabula Ndebele spoke on Steve Biko and the envisioned self. Professor Pumla Gaboro Marikezala on intergenerational trauma and the Black Lives Matter movement. Professor Crane Sodin on scholars and the archives. Uh, Ms. Angela Saini, the British science journalist on the return of racial science in the disciplines. And last year, Professor Jacob Dlamini of Princeton University on crisis and catastrophe in South African history. The 2022 lecture is offered jointly by ASIF, as you heard, the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Studies and the University of Fortier. Now imagine you're standing in your kitchen and the phone rings one day. You say who is speaking with some degree of irritation. You then say to the other person on the phone, come on, get out of here, leave me alone. I thought it was a prank, said our speaker, except it was a call from the Nobel Committee. Now he had to tell his wife, who was at the zoo <laughs> with their grandson, all of this. <laughs> I got from New Frame. There's so much one could say of this chronicler of the Swahili coast, as Julius Lucas called him in The New Yorker, this preeminent novelist of the migrant condition and of the afterlives of colonial rule. And at this very sad juncture in South African history, um, where we have developed uh, an animosity, a hatred towards the migrant who looks like us. This talk could not have come at a better time. But my friend and colleague, John Higgins, Emeritus Professor of English and the Ardern Chair at UCT, will now formally introduce the seventh annual Humanities Lecture, Professor Higgins. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for this opportunity to say a few brief words about a, a body of work that I've come to know and love, but only over the past five years or so, thanks to Tina Steiner and Louise Green, who really introduced me to that body of work. And, you know, my usual thing is I'll go on for hours and hours, but uh, it wouldn't be appropriate to do so. So I'm going to rein myself in and just say one or two words. And the first thing is kind of about the place of the humanities in the Academy of Science. The motto of the Academy is uh, science in the service of society. And that motto has always frightened me a little bit because it suggests perhaps too strongly that we know what we want, we know where we're going, and everything is going to be good. 
the humanities, I think, has a more cautious and more skeptical and in some ways reflective understanding of things. And I think in a way it's important to say that because it tells us something which I think is quite um, profound about the body of work of our uh, guest speaker and Nobel Prize winner as it's a body of work which is not uh, devoted to certainty, but is rather devoted to profound questioning and, and self-questioning. And I think it's important to frame the award and the body of work in the present moment we are in, which worldwide is one of a threat or a reality of massive violence and trauma and political instability and perhaps in some ways too much political certainty many times, driven, I think, by what I might as a professor of literature say is a certain kind of literary form which has real effects. And the form, mm, you know, I won't go into considerable footnoted detail, is one associated with social media and Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And it's a vitriolic world of monologue and constant self-assertion and assertion of my identity over your identity. And it's, it's driving us into frenzies, into violence, xenophobic violence in South Africa and elsewhere, violence in, a, in the USA, in Brexit of Britain, everywhere. And I want to say, to speak quite quickly, that that is the violence of monologue monologue amplified by social media. And what is the antidote to that? Well, I don't know if there is an easy antidote. But certainly, the novel, as a particular form of narrative knowing, with a long and ongoing history, is a form of knowledge which is devoted not to monologue, but to dialogue, whose inner principle is dialogue and recognition of the other, and through that recognition of the other, a new recognition of the self. And I think that is one of the profound reasons that our guest has won the prize because I believe so, your work embodies the profound strengths of the novel's commitment to a form of dialogue which can liberate the self and liberate others. Uh, but just let's step back for a moment to place the humanities again. And just to... Uh, I'd go on for a long time, but just to quote one telling thing for this kind of venue. It's Salim speaking from not the most recent novel, I think, but the previous one, Gravel Heart. Uh, Salim speaking. It's a dilemma many students in South Africa struggle with. I've decided not to continue with business studies, but to change to studying literature. Actually, that is what I wanted to do from the beginning. But I taught myself out of it because it seemed an indulgence. I should learn something useful which would earn me a lot of money. What is the point of literature? 
Well, of course, we can say, you know, if you win the Nobel Prize, you might earn <laughs> a little bit of money to go on with. But more interestingly, it can take you both into and away from yourself. And my recent article, on, upcoming article on this body of work, talks about how the beginnings of this rich body of work were in essentially private meditations, the noting down of almost like diary extracts and conversations with the self, that is in monologue. But in and through the act of writing, through narrating, through encountering and representing meetings with others in narrative and fictional form, that monologue gave way to a dialogue which changed both the self-writing and I think all readers. Because one of the great strengths of Professor Gorner's work is the challenging of stereotypes, racial stereotypes in particular, and the poking fun or undermining of the self-held stereotypes of uh, white racists and supremacists. It's an extraordinary body of work in how it moves ever deeper into forms of dialogue which enrich and do not contain the self. And in a wonderful interview with Tina Steiner, uh, there's a, a phrase which really held me, which is, uh, if you do have home ground, then you lose the capacity for complexity. You lose the capacity for complexity. And in South Africa, as in the USA, in Brazil, in you know, everywhere virtually, we need to have complexity to try and stop the spread of identity-driven violence. And although the Nobel Prize states that uh, it's given for the uncompromising and compassionate penetration of the effects of colonialism and the fates of the refugee in the gulf between cultures and continents, I think we can go even further than that. Because the truth of the matter is, is that in this body of writing, It, it moves away from the very vocabulary we have to identify things. Refugee is not quite right. Because even if you were a naturalized citizen of any particular country in this catastrophe-laden world, none of us are at home in the crumbling world. And we need to face that in all its complexity in order to act against the ongoing and upcoming <coughs> violence. So thank you for this rich, encouraging, deep body of work which we're here in part to celebrate. Thank you very much. And now, it's my privilege to present the man of the moment, Professor Abdul Razak Gurnau. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. I'm overwhelmed. 
Uh, yes, it is the second time I'm visiting Stias. Well, rather, the first time wasn't a visit because it was a fairly lengthy stay. Um, and there have been other visits to South Africa, all of which have been uh, enjoyable and in some respects um, almost envious. Um, very, uh, very often when I listen to people like we have been listening right, right now, speaking about South Africa with such uh, pessimism. Um, I think, no, no, don't feel so bad. It's actually a lot better than you think. It's a lot better than so many other places uh, where people don't enjoy even the capacity for argument, for sharing and challenging ideas and saying, this is rubbish, this is no good, we must do better than this. But anyway, everybody has to do their own thing. But, but I have always felt when I come to South Africa that I'm coming to a place where people are talking, something's going on. Rather than people are forced into silence. In any case, thank you very much for inviting me, the combined forces of ASEF and STIAS and Stellenbosch. And thank you all very much. We were very happy. I was delighted to be invited. I'm delighted to be here. I started writing the, 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 the last novel I published. There hasn't been much writing or publishing. Well, actually, that's not true but, uh, in the last year or so because you know, the, this wonderful award does mean that you have obligations of various kinds. Uh, people want to meet you, etc. New editions, you have to go here and there to speak about the books and so But in any case, uh, the last novel uh, I published, which was Afterlives, I started writing it here, and I guess it came really nicely here. So I'll come back when I'm ready to write the next one. <laughs> anyway, I, start, I started writing it here and um, got quite a lot of it done, actually, in those three months or so that we were here. So I so have very fond memories of both uh, Stellenbosch, of South Africa, as I've already mentioned, and also of the time, that particular time we were here. I also remember Right here, we did some stomping in the vineyard there. Uh, uh, and then there was a, a barbecue here with plenty of the wine that was being grown, uh, that had been grown over the years here. I can't remember how we got back to our uh, accommodation afterwards. But I do remember Christoph took a lot of pictures. <laughs> so the evidence exists somewhere. Anyway, when I came here in 2018, when we came here in 2018, in January, I had just recently uh, retired from the University of Kent, where I'd been teaching for the previous 35 or so years. Um, so I'm going to start talking, as, as you know, the subject of my lecture was, uh, is rather rereading. And I want to explain, first of all, how that, uh, I came to that. And retirement is part of that, that's why I mentioned that. Because at retirement, um, there was an office full of books that had to be uh, dealt with. Um, times have changed. I remember when I was a PhD student that the senior professor was not actually required to leave his office or her office. And so could, or at least not at once anyway. And so could leave the books there and he did use the office if he or she wanted to come in. And, you know. uh, but times have changed, of course. Now offices are not those were the uh, property of, the, of anybody. In fact, you're sometimes lucky if you have your own rather than sharing one. Anyway, so there you go. The can't remember which date, 31st of August or something. Those books have got to go. Um, anyway, so they went the only place they could go, which was home. Um, and there were um, something like over 20 boxes of books, which were nicely packed for me mostly, but, and delivered, so I didn't have to do it. This is 20 boxes that take home, in addition, of course, to those that were already at home. Um, and although we have a reasonably comfortable house, <laughs> it's not that big, it's not big enough to turn into a... So something had to be done. How was, how was I to decide what to keep and what to give away? Which is a problem that some of you have faced and I'm sure many of you will face in due course. 
there were some books which I had been teaching from year in, year out for decades. And I knew that I was not likely to read them again. And there were others whose function was so narrowly pedagogical that it was no difficulty to, to offer those to younger colleagues or to graduate students, you know, the kind of thing I mean, Norton Anthology of Modernism, that kind of thing. So at first, it was a lot easier than I had imagined. Until I looked closely, I did not realize how many books remained on my office bookshelves out of sheer idleness, or because I had once taught a text, or someone had suggested that I read such and such, and I had succumbed. And there they sat, performing no other function than endorsing the breadth of my intellectual inquiries. There were hard evidence of the wits of my reading, should anyone have considered to question it. <laughs> Many of those went unproblematically into the boxes intended for Oxfam. That left me with the ones that I thought I might read again, which was still a larger number of boxes than I had anticipated. The principle for the rest then became what was I likely to reread? And would I regret it if I parted with them too soon? Will I ever read And Quiet Flows the Dawn again, having read it at least four or five times in years gone past? Or Catch-22? Or The Cherry Orchard? Or The Blythedale Romance? Will I really read The Paint of Signs again? Or Seven Pillars of Wisdom? In the event, I kept most of them, <laughs> of course. Even though Oxfam ended up with uh, eight out of the 20 boxes in the first run through. So now then it was necessary to start rereading to see if I had made the right choice in deciding to keep them. So let me think this through. Do I intend to reread because the text has receded in memory? There's a simple test to this. You can ask, you can do this yourself. Like, how does such and such a book end? When you can't remember the ending, then perhaps it's time to reread. So, it could be because I would like to have a go at rereading because it's receded, it's too long ago. An example of this for me was uh, rereading uh, William Saroyan's The Daring Young Man on the Flying Trapeze, which I had read a long, long time ago. And I remember I read it with pleasure, but I couldn't remember how it went, kind of thing. And it was a pleasure to do so, to read again. But I'm anticipating. First, I'm saying how to think this through. Is it because the text has receded in memory? Is that the reason for saying, OK, you can stay, and I'll reread you? Is it because the memory of the previous reading is pleasurable, and the desire is to repeat the experience? Or was the previous reading experience disappointing? the more likely uh, outcome, as it was, for the rereading. Was the previous reading experience disappointing? I, and I wish to give the book another look to see if I've been hasty in my judgments or inattentive to the quality of what I was reading. In other words, what is it that we look for when we decide that we're going to reread? In this ex so this experience was also a way of kind of checking that out. You know, what is it? What is the reason for I've made this decision? And what, what do I find? Can I actually see this through? There are more ambitious reasons as well. Something like, I know, I'm going to read Dickens from beginning to end. That kind of thing. Um, but rereading the books was a way of just testing this through. It was, in fact, an unexpected pleasure in most cases. Too ambitious in others. I couldn't reread the whole of Dickens. I think I got to two and I thought, mm, leave it for a year or two and then we'll come back <laughs> and do the rest. Or I uh, immediately remember what had made me put the book down in the first place. <laughs> and therefore I was able to deal with that one quickly. So two or three pages, yep, okay, fine, that was why. Sometime during this process, 
I re-encountered Peter Abrams and began looking for his books. Let me tell you how I re-encountered him because it wasn't, it wasn't in my you know, boxes of books that I found him. I re-encountered him because somebody sent me um, a CD of a reading that they, it wasn't just the person who sent the thing, but a group, a family group actually as it happens, who loved the work of Peter Abrams and they performed the work and recorded this CD. Um, and they did it because it was intended to be a gift for Peter Abrams uh, as, a, as his 100th birthday present. And uh, as you know, which was going to be 2019, but as you know, he was murdered in 2017. Uh, so he never received this gift, but he did receive the early um, sketches as to what they were doing, because they asked his permission to see would he be you know, okay with them doing this. So one of, the, one of the nice, well, sometimes, one of the nice things about this new notoriety I've acquired is that people send you things, uh, usually photographs of me, as if I need photographs of me. <laughs> uh, in, sometimes beautiful, glossy photographs, and, and they want me to sign them. Anyway, so I get those, but I got this and I thought, Peter Abrams, yeah, let me see if I can get one of his books off the shelf. And I couldn't find any Peter Abrams on my bookshelves. Most likely though, borrowed by students and never returned, you know what they're like. Never mind, I'll get one, I'll buy one, I'll go and look them up, I'll start reading. Um, nothing was available on online bookshops that I checked out. Or if there were, well, many of us buy books in, um, online now because actually to be quite honest, I was almost certain that I wouldn't find any Peter Abrams books if I went and looked in our bookshop in Canterbury. Some were available on second-hand bookshop sites that I visited, but at inflated prices, 200 pounds for you know, Mind Boy or something like that which in itself, I think, is an interesting phenomenon. The scarcity of his books, I mean. It made me think of the topic of rereading in a different way. And just about that time, I got your invitation to come and speak here, so I thought, right, this will give me an opportunity to, as it were, to, to see how a process of rereading somebody like Peter Abrahams might work out, especially when the books are actually not available, and trying to think about why they're not available and what does that mean So then I chose to speak about how the works of some writers seem to disappear, and perhaps undeservedly so. But I thought I'll check this out. Is it undeserved? In a recent publication, Peter Abrahams is grouped as one of the South African writers whose subject was the black township milieu. <coughs> the black township milieu. <clears throat> but I think this hardly does his work justice. I think of the tenderness uh, with which he evokes the child's encounter with the world in Tell Freedom, for example. And it seems to me that he's writing about a child's vulnerability in all time, not just in South Africa, not just in a township. Anyway, I began with Wild Conquest which was published in 1951, which was the first of his books that it, was, it seemed to be easy to find. And I was surprised at how much of it I remembered, even though I first read it as a teenager. When I read it then, that was the first time I had any inkling of the Africana dilemma. Up to then, it was all cut and dried for me, as for many of us in that generation. The police dogs of Sharpville were the same dogs of Birmingham, Alabama. 
And the wars in Mozambique and Angola were a continuation of the wars in Algeria, in Sinai, and what was then Rhodesia. When I first read Wild Conquest, I think that was the first time I had even the most elementary understanding of Africana existence, of Africana cruelty, and in the end, I think the inevitable implosion in, in the varieties of denial, regret, and evasion, which the novel details so carefully. I was struck by how much empathy Peter Abrams extends to this dilemma, in particular to Anna in the early stages of the novel. Maybe there is a simple way of understanding this, which is to give all the tenderness to the women of the ugly ideology. The Hollywood Western movie provides the paradigm. The man's grievances have made him hard of hearts, heart rather, and he wants revenge and punishment, while the woman sees the futility and self-destructiveness of that. In the days when there were cinemas in Zanzibar, which aren't anymore, with live audiences, and the show was a Western, there was often a moment when, as the scowling, clenched-jawed hero was saddling his horse and adjusting his gun belt in preparation for riding out against whoever had enraged him, when the wife or lover would cling to him and beg him not to ride out, then the audience would howl with disgust and advise the hero to take no notice of the dithering idiot and would cheer with relief when the man shrugged off the clinging woman and rode off to put the world to rights. In fact, of course, the pioneer women in the colonial encounter in North America, in Australia, in India, and of course, in South Africa, were just as frightened and eager for the death of native people as the men were. For Anna, there is a moment of division when she becomes part of an Africana enterprise rather than a personal one. In the figures of Paul van der Est and Anna, it seems to me that Peter Abrahams is trying to convey some sense of what he intuited to be the colonial settler predicament. The impulse to coerce and dominate in order to secure a grip on the land, which is consolidated by an ideological narrative of exceptionalism and entitlement, on one hand. And on the other hand, the suppressed awareness of the duplicity and stridency of the narrative. Thus, for Anna, the father's anthem of with my Bible and my rifle is exposed as inadequate to account for the transformation that she observes in her husband and the people around her. In Wild Conquest, Abrahams makes Anna die of grief for what has become of her people. In addition to this profound humanizing of what I have called the Africana predicament, Abraham speculates so well on his sources by allowing his boars to love the land in their own way. I was surprised that the tenderness extended to Anna is withheld from the Ndebele. It made me wonder if what is implied here is somehow a narrative of Boer sincerity which is distorted by ideology on the one hand and on the other hand of Ndebele savagery. There is Mkonozi, of course, who is evoked in the novel's epigraph, epigraph rather. And I see, I began to wonder, is this the post-colonial Gagul? You may remember Gagul from King Solomon's Minds. But the narrative of savagery is already part of the retrieval of the figure of the advisor. He was a wise savage rather than an evil one although there is the evil team of witch finders in the background. Is this, at, at the time, the only post-colonial retrieval possible? Is this an argument for discarding 
the narrative of what is here perceived as a distracting nostalgia for defeated nobility and to discard it in favor of irresistible modernity? Is this part of the reason such a text failed to hold its own as time passed? There are brief attempts to enter the consciousness of the Ndebele actors, which in itself is a risky business, given the form the novel has taken so far, because it's a diffusion and loss of narrative focus, as it seems to me. As the inevitable encounter looms between the Boers tra tracking north and the Bele unaware, apparently, of what's coming, as the inevitable encounter looms, there are also attempts to understand who the other is. These men who come from nowhere, the king says. It is here that Mkomazi, the advisor, it is here that Mkomazi comes more fully into the foreground and carries the, con the concluding argument of the novel. That the imaginary other, the looming boar, is a brother. It recalls the novel's, ep the novel's epigraph. I'm quoting, this book is for the South Africans who may fulfill old Mkomazi's dream and and here he quotes Mkomazi, perhaps in the ages to come. Build in hope instead of fear, live with love instead of hate. That's the end of the epigraph. It is a surprisingly upbeat closure when we know that there is only more horror and humiliation awaiting Mzilikazi's people and his son Lobengula. So it does seem to me putting on the one hand uh, with as much sympathy and empathy as possible, the predicament of the Boers, as, they, as personified, if you like, by Anna and her, her death in the tragic way that the, you know, the people become uh, narrow and cruel. And on the other, the passing, if you like, of an unlamented passing on the whole of another way of life, which can, can also not be defended or sustained. So a more complex book than it looks at first, I think. So in a different order, I then read Mine Boy, because that's the one I got next, I no choice. It was an earlier novel, 1951, for Wild Conquest, 1946. He was incredibly prolific, Peter Rams, in that period from 1940. Five, I think, when he published the first collection of stories until about 1954, 55, when he published Aretha Odomo. All these books just came out every year, another book, every year, another book. So 1946 for Mind Boy, which incidentally was published by, uh, rather strangely, by a, a British publisher for the first time, uh, who was a, a right-wing figure who um, kind of annoyed everybody and fought everybody. Um, especially on the right. Um, but she published two of uh, Peter Abrams' books, including Mind Boy. Anyway, it was an earlier novel, 1946. It's a novel that is often accompanied by the opinion that it was the first work of fiction to bring the reality of South Africa's racial politics to an international audience. Well, I think that's the problem with the international audience, rather than that there was other works that were already doing this. But nonetheless, if you're a writer and you get something like that, a blurb like that on the front cover of the book, why argue? <laughs> what it does so well, I think, is to show the lives of people oppressed and belittled by power, money, and a corrupt ideology. It does this by extending sympathy to people who to all appearances are degraded and defeated by their circumstances. <clears throat> and to show also the necessary strategies they employ to survive without losing sense of their humanity. For example, despite her great toughness and wisdom, the Shibin owners Leah, she's described as her face grows weaker at the memory of her husband, 
who is inevitably in jail. There is also a brilliant description of Lena, one of the women who works for Leah, undergoing drunken horrors. It's a very powerful description. I'll quote it to you. Her mouth had slowly opened and a stream of saliva was trickling down to her dress. Her body trembled. Her hands knotted into tight fists. Slowly, she slid down the side of the wall till she lay stretched on the pavement. Her eyes glazed, and but for the trembling of her body, she lay like one dead. A figure of degradation, drunk in the street, collapsed like that. Yet at other times, we see the same Lena caring for others with unparalleled concern. Another scene later, which is brilliantly orchestrated, it seems to me, is a description of a man crawling along the roof with the police on the street as you were kind of, and some actually crawling along the roof as well, trying to get to him. Um, and the tension is beautifully controlled. And somebody says, what has he done? Nobody knows, but there are these crowds of people and the police and so on. Eventually, by some his, his miraculous agility, he actually escapes the police, and a doctor who was also present there vouches for him and says, because right, he was injured as he fell, I'll look after him and I will bring him to the police station afterwards, but first let me fix his arm. So the police agree to let him um, take this person to his surgery where he fixes his arm and leaves him there for a moment, says, do you want something to eat or something like this? I can't remember all the details. And he goes inside and the man runs away and picks up what he can from the surgery and disappears. Generosity repaid by what? I don't know. Survival, I suppose. Anyway, so we see scenes like that, which are, which are not kind of, the, so mind boy, in other words, does not romanticize or, in, in, or ennoble uh, the lives of these township people. Somebody who's just been saved from the police, just had his arm fixed, nonetheless steals from the doctor and runs away. It shows that, for certain, Mindboy shows that the city is a deracinator. And it does this primar primarily in its portrayal of the lives of the mine workers, and particularly that of Zuma. It is several days after arriving in the city that he thinks of the people at home. This is what I mean by deracinator. It's a man who's lost his connections. The novel shows the violence in the streets. I quote, Many men have died in these fights, for they fight with sticks and knives and shoes, even stones. I have to say I was a bit puzzled about the shoes, but anyway. Mine Boy shows the harshness of the mind system. The rendering of the brutal system is so matter of fact, which makes the telling work brilliantly, I think. And it shows the compliance of the workers and with it, the self-destructiveness, the lack of self-worth that comes along with that. So alongside a community ethos of suffering and the privileging of strength and manliness, there is also the brutality, which is the daily reality. At one point, the Malay Camp Township is described as a stream of dark life, but in it runs a kind of human survival. Ma Planck, one of the other drunks, tells of Daddy, an old drunk. He was a man such as I have never seen. His death, when it comes later in the novel, is like a scene from Little Dorrit from its melodrama. So sometimes maybe it does go over the top a little bit. There is also a love story in my boy. What is a novel without a love story? Well, what is life without love? Zuma is besotted with a woman called Eliza, who is herself besotted with white values, as they are described, or at least with the upward mobility they signify. So it seems a hopeless, lo a hopeless love from the start. When at last Eliza gives in to Zuma's desire for her, the evocation of the moment does not convince. 
passion suddenly overcoming all the niggles might work as a momentary loss of control, but as a depiction of profound love, it always seems staged to demonstrate Eliza's error. Their love and reconciliation seems too easy. The treatment of these emotional moments between the two seem light when something deep is indicated, that is to say the desire for whiteness on the one hand and Zuma's, how should we put it, that irresistible love as it were, he can't get over what he feels for her. So it seems to me that, that that's one of the moments when things don't quite work in the novel. Just as easy seems the mass message of reconciliation towards the end of the novel. There is an episode where Zuma walks at night in the white district in Johannesburg. He walks among people as if they're not really there. That's how the description goes. And as he does so, he runs into his white man. This is part of the uh, language of the minds. He runs into his white man, his mind boss, Paddy Red, who is out walking with his partner, Dai. They take him home and offer him food. So your suspicions are already kind of, hmm, really? Bump into somebody in the streets and take him home for dinner? Okay, anyway. So they take him home and offer him food, which, which is then followed by an unlikely conversation about manhood between Zuma and Dai. It turns out that Paddy sees Zuma as the future native. And Dai's argument is that he will only be the future when he learns how to live equitably with women. It seems to me a garbled scene expressing a desire for an optimistic future that the preceding narrative had shown to be beyond reach. Peter Abrams writes Return to Goli very soon after this, when he returned to South Africa for six weeks as a journalist. He writes this as a report for The Observer, I think, and quite a different story comes out there. In a recent publication, which my good friend Tina Steiner sent to me, um, Peter Abrahams is grouped as one of the South African writers whose subject was the black township milieu. I've already remarked on how it seems to me that the tenderness with which child, the child's encounter with the world in Tell Freedom takes us beyond this idea of uh, township milieu. A familiar suggestion for the absence or the relative obscurity, shall we say, of Peter Abrams' work is that the exclusion of these foundational writers, as this publication calls them, from current academic programs, this was 2018, is because they're seen to have a narrow nationalist frame of reference. They don't deal with issues to do with women or to do with, I suppose, uh, family concerns or indeed to do with various categorizations, stereotypes, etc. And this publication I'm referring to is concerned to prove that this is rather about the power of canon formation in the academy and is not a sustainable reading of Abraham's work, which has a broader agenda in both issues of gender and race. But is the power of canon formation an adequate explanation for the relative neglect of Abraham's writing? Is the opinion of the academy so influential on the reading public that on the reception and on the reception of texts, it might be so where reading is so directly linked to the academy, I suppose, but this is not so where a broader reading culture exists. I don't think it is so to account for Peter Abrams' neglect, either in South Africa or elsewhere. 
In his memoir, Tell Freedom, which I've already referred to a couple of times, Peter Abrams gives us a clue of his complicated sources. So I'm going to just uh, read a little bit of what he says in the very early pages of Tell Freedom. He says, and I don't know how many of you knew this, but he says, my father came from Ethiopia. He was a son of landowners and slave owners. He had seen much of Europe before he came to South Africa. I recall a time when she, my mother, I recall a time when she made me recite like a catechism my father's family tree. It went something like this. Now here, Abrams is quoting the catechism within what I'm quoting of him. I am Peter Henry Abrahams Deras, son of James Henry Abrahams Deras, whose name at home was Karim Abdul, son of Ingedi, and then followed by hyphen, sorry, uh, parenthesis with an E. Ingedi is spelled I-N-G-E-D-I, and then with a hyphen, and then an E. Sorry, with a parenthesis and an E. So, whose name at home was Karim Abdul, son of Ingedi, of Addis. It went on for a very long time, and Deras, inverted commas now, in Abraham's own text, and Deras, or Deras, two words, Deras, also inverted commas, was the family title. Well, as you would know, if I may just pause there for a second, Ras in uh, Amharic is the name for a prince, or uh, in any case, a title of respect. But what's puzzling about all that is his name at home was Karim Abdul, which would make him a Muslim. It's not explained, but there you go. It goes on, just a little bit more now. My mother was a widow of a Cape Malay who had died, the Cape Malay that is, who had died the previous year, and left her with two children. They lived in 19th Street, Redudop, to this street and this house came the Ethiopian. There he wooed my mother. There he won her. They married from that house. They found a house of their own further down the street. They made it a home of love and laughter. End of, no, not quite. not quite. From there, the Ethiopian went to work in the mines each morning. To that house, he returned at the end of each day. Then my father died, you know, in an accident at the mines. Uh, Peter Abrams was five years old when that happened. And if you've read Tell Freedom, you'll know the chaos that engulfs their lives. It is, it's a very complicated history, it seems to me. All of a sudden, in one generation, Ethiopia, Cape Malay, death of the father, and all of that. He's then, if you follow the story and tell freedom, he's then passed on from one relative to another, in one place to another, like this. It is out of uh, <clears throat> this tragic beginning, which is also a moment of possibility, that is to say, you remember that? He wooed my mother, then he won her, they married, house of laugh, love and laughter, etc. So it is out of this tragic beginning, which is also a moment of possibility, overwhelmed by the injustice with which people lived, that the optimism of mind boy comes from. The poignancy with which tell freedom evokes these moments and their confoundment, the moments of happiness, I mean, and their confoundment is far more moving, it seems to me, than the fictionalized optimism of the former. I'm suggesting that although Mind Boy tells the story, which comes pretty close, I think, to some of the things that obviously befell um, Peter Abraham's family, but it has a different ending, which is an ending of reconciliation and so on. So the poignancy with which Tell Freedom evokes these moments and their confoundment is far more moving than the fictionalized optimism of the former. Anyway, I gather, I'm closing now, I think my time's up. I gather that there is a new edition of A Wreath for Domo, which is good. 
I would also want to make sure that Mind Boy and Tell Freedom are also soon released, and preferably released alongside each other. In any case, what we know for sure after this brief rereading is that these are not works that deserve to be neglected. Thank you very much. Not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's so inspirational um, to listen to you speak with such calmness and poise, and it like just reaches and pierces into your heart when you say these wonderful words of your your uh, take on novels. And I mean, the, the way you position the whole concept of rereading. I only reread because I forget what I read in the first <laughs> five minutes beforehand. So thank you, thank you ever so no, much. That's because you read those boring uh, admins. Hi, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Colleagues, I've asked uh, Professor Gurnau if he is happy to take a few questions, and he's agreed. So I open the floor for some discussion. And if you have any burning questions you'd like to pose to him, now is your chance. So here goes. Who would like to kick off? Ah, Professor Mao. Oh, thank you. Shall I deal with yeah, this you, myself? You, you do, yes. You made, you made a lot of uh, slavery in the afterlife. It's a book that I enjoy very much. And my question is a different one. This matter of reparations keeps coming up. What's your view on it? <laughs> Now I have to be a politician. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's important. I think it's important. Um, I was recently in Germany, where in Germany they've been talking about this a lot. I was at the Humboldt Forum, where they hold, you may know, uh, a lot of the plundered artifacts from uh, various German um, territories in, in Africa, in the Pacific, etc. And there's a real conversation and argument going on about what to do. Um, the recent record, recent in the sense of the 20th century record of, uh, of Germany's um, actions in Africa have been, as you all know, brutal and uh, genocidal in the case of the Herero Nama people in um, what was South Southwest Africa. And After Lives talks about another historical episode where, again, the casualties were staggering, but there they've been quietly forgotten on the whole. Um, but they're coming back. I think there is serious conversation, and I think what the Germans have done is important, um, even if it doesn't reparate anything, really. I mean, you know, you don't kill 400,000 people and then give a million pounds and say, okay, that doesn't work, or, or other. But what it does is symbolic. What it does is, first of all, it says we accept responsibility for what we did. We did something for which something has to be paid Back. Now, what the form of that is, is between the, I suppose, different people concerned. There is also another way of doing this, which the British haven't got round to, although they're coming around to it, uh, which is uh, to, to return things, literally return objects. The Humble Forum is doing this, and some of the private institutions in the UK are also doing this, uh, returning things without payment you know, without being paid, because some, some places they say, well, all right, this thing is now worth so many millions. Pay that money and we'll give it to you. Well, so I do think it's important for symbolic reasons. And it varies depending on what uh, the act being reparated is, as it were. You know, so in the Caribbean, for example, the, there is a strong movement for saying slavery and the aftermath destroyed uh, so much that you, know, you just have to more or less recreate us, as you were, the community, I mean, for nation. So different circumstances may require different responses, but something, I think, morally and just simply in terms of the symbolism, which something is necessary. But that's just me speaking. I don't have, uh, I can't make anybody do anything. Any other questions or comments? 
Yeah. No, they've had enough. <laughs> okay. All right. Jonathan, any from you? No. I'm so true. <laughs> oh, there seems to be someone on that. Thank you so much, Professor, for this wonderful lecture. I'm, I'm just very curious, this whole process of rereading novels, uh, is there this, a more or less similar process with rereading poetry, for instance? Uh, did you come across that problem? Or I always wonder where poetry features. It, it is maybe the stepchild of literature. So uh, I wonder how you look at poetry and rereading poetry and if you came to that problem. Yeah, I don't know about stepchild of literature because, in fact, un until until a certain stage in the 19th century, uh, very late in the 19th century, uh, poetry was literature. So that the beginnings of fiction, which is why in in, uh, in so many in so much of the writing of the late 19th century, the reading novels is often presented as a frivolous activity which women do, because because to read literature is to read poetry. Um, how, how different is it to reread poetry? Well, in a sense, I suppose we reread re 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 poetry all the time, at least the poetry that we find engaging and moving, um, partly because you can read it for half an hour, say, and put it away, and that's okay for the time being, in, the, in a way that you can't quite do with prose, I don't think. Um, in the process of um, my, my rereading experience, um, most of the poetry I taught, so we're talking here about books that are both in the, at home as well, as well as at work, would probably have been romantic poetry, for example, which I taught, and some modernist poetry as well. I taught modernism as well, so these would have been the subjects. Um, and I think I gave them all away. I think part of the reason, apart from a handful, I think part of the reason that it's possible to do that, it is actually so very easy to find, say, romantic poetry, unless you are an expert and you're a scholar and you want to be able to get this edition as opposed to that edition and that kind of thing. Um, and with modernist poetry, aside from a handful, I did find they were kind of grating on me a little bit after so many years of trying to pretend that they weren't <laughs> because I had to teach them. Um, and uh, also, I guess, for, I'm only talking about my experience, see, because I reckon, you know, that. Uh, probably prose matters more to me in the sense of um, uh, it's part of my practice, my business as well, my profession in a sense. So I probably go back to, to that more often. That's the best I can come up with, I'm afraid. Um, versus a broader reading culture. So I, I wanted to know, uh, 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 firstly, how would you, uh, how do you think one should develop a broader reading culture in a period where uh, uh, we are dominated by the online media, which works against a broader, a broader reading culture in a sense? And then uh, do you think that a broader reading culture would um, help with the recovery of uh, those writers whose work have uh, has disappeared. Yeah, well, I don't feel dominated by online culture. Um, I, I feel that um, there is room enough to to find out about a, uh, a great variety of um, work that is being uh, both produced right now, contemporary work, but also that is constantly being represented to us by people that have you read so and so. The number of times I think, oh, I haven't read, and somebody mentions. Uh, a writer from, say, the 1950s or the 1940s or even earlier. Um, that I think we do this to each other all the time, remind ourselves, remind each other, I mean, of, of, um, of uh, writers maybe, I hope I've done that today for Peter Abrahams, for some people who might say, yes, I've heard this name, but I haven't got around to it. I think that's what we do. We, we do kind of tell each other about um, things we should pay more attention to in this way. Um, well, what bothers me a little bit, which is why I think it's important to do that, is because um, there is, in the, in the business of selling and publishing books, perfectly reasonable in many ways, there is always um, 
an uh, interest in the new one, uh, publish the new one. Well, publishers know that. They know that uh, if you're reading, shall we say, casually, then the new book that's just been announced and people are, and it's there in the bookshop, and da, 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 you pick it up. And it's a lot harder to say you have to go and look for one, um, unless it's been made into a film, of course. Uh, so there are, there are ways in which there is a kind of a popular dissemination of what you should read. Um, but you know, there are ways of uh, doing that with almost everything, what you should wear, what you should eat, where you should go for a holiday. But there's also another way of finding out and, and being, being discriminating and, and opening up your mind to things. So I think that's, forget the online. Listen, listen to what people are saying instead. You're closing us down. No, no, no. I'm opening it up for another. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gurna. Do I go back? Uh, you can have a seat, and uh, <laughs> we will. Prepare, uh, prepare. I agree, that was indeed a, a, a brilliant lecture, and thank you for bringing, uh, rereading and reminding us of the work of Peter Abrams, which I read many years ago, uh, and so on. Anyway, uh, when I first got back into the country from studying abroad, I ended up at the University of Durban Westville, and my first dean was uh, uh, a woman called uh, Devarakshanam Govindan, or Betty Govindan, and um, the best dean I've ever had and tried to emulate. And over the years, uh, I was a science graduate, uh, first degree in science, so I knew nothing about literature, uh, except for Betty to this very day, sending me, pestering me with yet another reading that I must read before I do anything else early in the morning, late at night. Uh, just incredible poetry that she also writes, and particularly on the Indian um, diaspora. So we thought it would be completely appropriate to ask Betty to do some closing reflections, and, uh, and Betty's going to speak from over there. Thank you. And uh, over to you, Betty. Professor Jonathan Jansen, Professor Himmler Sadal of the Academy of Science of South Africa and the, your larger membership, Sitas and Professor Kirimira and our partners here, distinguished guests all. Professor Abdul Razak Gurna, your literary writings in general remind us that the afterlives of our histories linger and persist in the nooks and crannies of our world. Whether it's across continents or regions or nations or in our institutional or individual lives. Your lecture today adds another important and oft forgotten dimension. The afterlives of literary texts. The way that texts of yesteryear speak to us today. Albeit with its fissures and cracks of its time the way they speak to us today with a currency and an immediacy that might have eluded us. In South Africa, we've been constantly nudged and challenged on the streets, on our campuses, and across the diverse spaces of our beloved country into an extended and prolonged and more intensive TRC. We are confronted with the perennial struggle of memory against forgetting. Your lecture today adds another potent layer to that struggle of memory against forgetting. You urge us to remember the ancient landmarks, the literary signposts of the past that point the way prophetically during our sojourn in the wilderness, the dark decades of the past and how we tried to make meaning and sense of what was not logical. While we constantly assert that our present is inextricably linked to our past, you remind us of the way our past writers and thinkers 
are speaking directly to our present challenges in, in its complexities, with its uncertainties, with its contradictions, in all its faltering and tentative ways. But this is a quest we must soldier on in. To invoke, to, uh, to invoke and adapt to Birago Diop, the Senegalese poet, born in 1906, and after reading your abstract, I began to think of so many born in the first century, first decade of the 20th century. Birago Diop says, the dead are not dead. They are in the trees and the woods, and you tell us that they are in the leaves of our books, and they are the voices whispering from the past into our ears. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Your literary writings have all confronted us with the challenges of retrieval. Indeed, more than that, the ethics of retrieval. Given that our lives are embedded and entangled in the palimpsest of our histories. And you remind us today of the way literary writings of the past have helped us in that journey, casting light on swathes of histories of intellectual journeys we have already traversed, which are there, a minefield waiting to be rediscovered. In your novel, By the Sea, you make us question whether it is really our fate to live in the wreckage and confusion of crumbling houses. And this is the question we must conscientiously ask in the ivory tower or in the nation and in the world as a whole. Your literary writings are marked by refusal. Refusal to accept the oppressor's lies and distortions. Refusal to accept the lies we, the oppressed, tell ourselves. You make us resist being eaten by our colonizers, whatever form they may take. And you recognize that passing reference to a little line in Afterlives. This is why literacy and critical literacy in your writings are so important for so many characters, including women, who appreciate the opportunity to learn to read and write. And we are learning now from you to reread and to rewrite. Sometimes those characters had to do this on pain of dire punishment. Your lecture today highlights the fearless seers and forerunners who intuitively understood this decades and decades and decades ago. This was true of Peter Abrahams whose life was a journey of reading and reading and rereading against the claustrophobic life that was thrust upon him, as he records in Tell Freedom, Memories of Africa, which was published in 1954, exactly 68 years ago. He understood Fanon's prayer in Black Skin, White Masks, published 70 years ago, Oh my body, make me a man, a woman who questions. Professor Gurna, your, in, your literary writings demonstrate that you are the intrepid traveler, the great cartographer, mapping the way for us through our collective histories, our collective realities. The co-narrator of your novel by the sea writes, I speak to maps and sometimes they speak back to me. These are, I must say, among the most evocative lines in literature for me. And my grandchildren will tell you how much I love maps and read maps all the time and question them about maps. As you write, before maps, the world was limitless. Against our limitless world, your mappings contribute to our finding our bearings, our possessionalities, as well as our crisscrossing roots and roots. It is true, as you write, maps make places on the edges of the imagination seem graspable and placeable. 
Your lecture today shows you're mapping our rich intellectual hinterland. Your presence here is also prompting us to ask about our disciplinary mappings, to constantly interrogate the way we understand territory in the academic world. And it is for this reason that I congratulate the Academy of Science of South Africa for inaugurating the Humanities Lecture and for the kind of work you at CS does as well. Our collective work, from knowledge and power, to genetics and human origins, to HIV AIDS, to the Square Kilometer Array Project, to archival and historical work, to literary studies and poetry, all constitute trenchant scholarship of the imagination, and indeed all in the service of humanity with the certainties and the uncertainties that are part of our journey. And these are all in the quest in different ways for a more habitable world. Our mission is a collective one and your lecture and your literary writings urge us against dispossessing and disinheriting ourselves in different ways. In a wider sense, we are all asylum seekers. And this is not to take away anything of the harsh realities that asylum seekers experience. We're all asylum seekers wrenched by our own doing from the paradise planet in all its multiplicity and largesse that we have inherited. And you show us what it means to return to our native land. I have my old graying copy here, and I'm actually rereading it. It means to return, it, what it means to return to our native land in the different senses of that journey back home. A journey that also includes the rediscovery and recuperation of our literary wealth and bounty. A heritage filled with faltering but probing analysis and insights for such a time as this. Professor Gurna, I've listened to you many, many times on YouTube. You always speak, I must confess, while I'm making roti. And uh, <laughs> why should I waste my time listening to Professor Gurna when I can make roti? <laughs> it's the other way around. You always speak in a slow, wise, and measured manner prodding us to think deeply. It's an absolute privilege to actually have you in our midst today, as we appreciate your gentle demeanor and your robust intellectual mind. At the end of the day, your writings and work is underlined by hope. As Olive Senior, the poet from Jamaica, where Peter Abrahams, exiled from South Africa, made his home, and sadly died there. And here I wish to commend the work of De De Dr. Denise Narayan, who was mentioned earlier, who is also with us tonight, and for her important literary work on Olive Senior and the other West Indian poets. Olive Senior reflects in one of her poems, H for Hope. Hope is still there inside the box, the Pandora's box waiting to be invited. And you constantly remind us of that. Jonathan, with your permission, I'd like to read this poem I have composed. May I? Yes. Thank you. So, uh, Professor Gurner, a few months ago, we, uh, I'm from Durban, and uh, we had the Durban International Book Fair. And we wanted to celebrate your winning of the Nobel Prize. And so the closest we could do was to remember you. We couldn't have you there. So that's why I'm so delighted that you're here today. And this was the poem that I had written uh, to celebrate your Nobel win. For Abdul Razak Gurna, Nobel Laureate in Literature, 2021. Your pen begins slowly, sedate lines on the quotidian, 
anchored to the shore, facing east. Severed, you try to recreate hearth and home under a different sky, endure the gaze on your body at once visible and invisible. You look south across mountain and desert. You see the reddening sky, spirals of histories unraveling. Your ink flows frenetic, frantic. You revisit lies. You revisit lies, silences, the Africa of your heart, paradise of dreams, tearing apart. Bereft under the southern sky, homeless and unhomed, the dark inkwells of anguish overflow. Begin to release reams of refusal, freeing trapped pasts from the prison house dungeons of yesteryear. Torrents of memory overflow, the burden of haunting. You create afterlives where hope triumphs. Building broken homes with bricks and mortar of words, homes lost to history, refugees of trade winds, blowing over faces, dreaming of paradise, writing the self the first gift and the last, arrivals and departures by the sea. Flotsam and jetsam of memories washed in by the tide, washed out in the waters of the voyage. Somehow, tenderness survives. Thank you. And I'd just like to say, as a postscript, that uh, that was written before you prepared your abstract for this uh, humanities lecture. And I felt quite emotional because that, that last line, it's in my footnotes, actually comes from Dennis Brutus, one of our old stalwarts, who wrote this in Stubborn Hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betty. That was uh, truly amazing. I, I, I do feel we've been to a feast, a literary feast today. What an incredible afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Abdul Razak. That was, that was brilliant. Thank you, Betty, for the amount of time, energy, emotion, and heart you put into that uh, presentation. Thank you, uh, John, for that superb introduction uh, to our guests. There are so many of you here from so many different institutions, different parts of the country. Uh, I hope you all uh, enjoyed this. Uh, I, I felt a little sorry for those of you who are nanotechnologists and cardiovascular surgeons and trying to figure out whether Peter Abrams was a linebacker for the <laughs> Chicago Bulls. But um, I, I think in good spirit, all of you enjoyed and followed this uh, quite amazing. This is a highlight, I think, Imla, you would say, I would say, in the, in the history of the humanities lecture. And uh, uh, what a joy to, to have this. Thank you, Edward, uh, for making all of this possible as well. I think there are refreshments outside. We're going, uh, we've invited, I think, about 20 people for dinner with Professor um, uh, Gurna. If you were not invited, don't feel disappointed. It's <laughs> the rest of them, uh, we invited them because of the ability to pay for the expenses uh, incurred uh, and so on. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the the Chasalachet outside. <laughs>